What would you say, brethren? Uh, what would you say, or what we what would we say, is the most outstanding example of faith in the Bible? Well, I guess the general consensus would be that of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac. It is perhaps the most famous example of faith that we have, and certainly it has given Abraham since that time the term the father of the faithful. Now it was a very strange request of God for his servant, because the God who condemns child sacrifice in the Bible commanded Abraham to make a sacrifice out of his only son. And of course Abraham was given three days to think over that, because the place God said he had to take Isaac to sacrifice him was three days journey away. Within that story, brethren, is something else even more outstanding, something that occurred as a result of Abraham's action. We think of what he did as the most outstanding example of faith in the Bible, but again, there is something else even more outstanding in that chapter. Let us turn to Genesis chapter 22 and begin the story in verse 1 as it unfolds for us. And as we study this very part of the Bible, brethren, let us notice the connection between Isaac and Jesus Christ, because Isaac was a type of Christ. We'll concentrate on that particular type that is given us here in the chapter. There is a parallel of Jesus Christ in all that took place to Isaac. Genesis 22 and verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested, or as Hebrew would have it, proved. God tested or proved Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Later on, brethren, thousands of years later, the temple was to be built on Moriah. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I shall tell you. And Abraham, as he was, brethren, did not delay to perform God's command, even though it was child sacrifice. And as it says in verse 3, he rose early. But we have to understand, brethren, that Abraham had known God for many decades up to this point. And his last concept about the character of God that he worshipped was that it was a God, you know, it was a God who demanded now the child, the sacrifice of children. Now, that was not characteristic of God. That was only for pagan gods, not the true God of the universe. So this command did not square with what Abraham knew about God. This command was so strange to what Abraham knew about the true God. But he did know that it was God's command, and therefore... He was going to obey. Verse 3, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So it was a group of four on this journey. Then, verse 4, On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Well, what was in Abraham's mind during the three days and how he was able to reconcile God's character and the fact that he was commanded to do this, it is real to us, brethren, in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. That's the chapter on faith. It's a chapter that speaks about great people of faith in the Old Covenant who cannot, as it says in Hebrews, cannot inherit the eternal life without us. Because God has in the New Covenant promised something better, so they are now waiting for their reward, and they will receive the same reward with us, along and together with us. In Hebrews 11, verse 17 through 19, in verse 19, brethren, it does say, speaking of this story, that Abraham that, uh, says that he, concluding that God was able to raise him up, that is Isaac, even from the dead, from which he also received him, in a figurative sense. So Abraham, brethren, realized, and he was aware, that God would bring back Isaac to life. So Isaac did not die, but when he got off that altar, Abraham was receiving him in a figure of the resurrection. It was a type of the resurrection. So perhaps we can begin to understand then why a three days journey was involved, because of the parallels between Isaac and Jesus Christ. 
Jesus would be dead three days and three nights in the grave and then would be resurrected. Verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Brethren, we, the Hebrew is plural and here in English it is plural. We will come back to you. Abraham was not lying. He believed that God would resurrect his son because he knew the promises that God had given that had to be fulfilled through Isaac. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac's, on Isaac his son, on Isaac's shoulders. So the very word, you know, that was to be the sacrifice, the funeral pyre or the funeral pole for Isaac was laid upon Isaac's shoulders. This is also a type of Jesus Christ before he was crucified. He was called upon to carry the wood of his own sacrifice, the cross upon his shoulders. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. Now, of course, Isaac asked the very obvious question. That's in verse 7. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, And this, of course, is a prophecy of Jesus Christ as we understand it. Perhaps, brethren, to Abraham it was just more the physical fulfillment that did take place in the new few verses. But for us, we do understand that it was prophetic of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. As we understand, brethren, Abraham was prepared to do the act. He was ready to go ahead and kill his son. That was in his mind because remember it says in Hebrews 11, he was expecting God to resurrect his son. So he did intend to kill him, but he was stopped before he actually did so. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Well, brethren, Abraham did have other sons. We have secular records that show that. And of course, there was Ishmael who was recorded in the Bible. But this was his only true son by his own one wife, Isaac. The other sons were from concubines. And this was the only son that God recognized was uh, Abraham's legitimate heir. Verse 13, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Well, what does this symbolize with the regard to Jesus Christ? We know that he is the Lamb of God. We know, of course, that he was an adult male, as the ram would symbolize, when he was to be crucified. But God could have brought the ram meekly to Abraham. After all, he did that with Noah when the animals came to the ark. They were not caught by the horns in thickets, brethren. They just came because God worked out that miracle and brought them meekly to the ark of Noah, to the ark for Noah, that is, which preceded this event. So why should it be that the ram was caught in a thicket by its horns? Well, again, this is another symbolism of Jesus Christ because a crown of thorns was to be placed upon his head. And so it was caught by its horns in the thicket. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of, please mark this, instead of his son. So Jesus Christ dies in our stead to make our life possible. Even at baptism, brethren, we go into a watery grave, but we come out of it alive as Isaac was laid there to be killed. But the death did not actually take place for him because a substitute was made on his behalf. Just as we go into a symbolic death at baptism because a true substitute has been made for us, Jesus Christ. So this is perhaps the greatest outstanding example of faith in the Bible. But as we said, there is something even more outstanding as contained in this chapter. Verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Well, this is a reference to the temple that was to be built on Mount Moriah. And of course, the Golgotha, where Jesus Christ was crucified, was in close proximity. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself have I, I have sworn. Brethren, again, underline these 
verse, these five words, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I'll multiply your descendants, plural, as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants, plural, shall possess the gate of their enemies. Verse 18, in your seed, singular, not plural this time, singular, in your seed, Jesus Christ, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So throughout there, throughout this chapter, brethren, there is a prophetic significance of Jesus Christ with the future sacrifice he made. But Jesus, speaking as the God of the Old Testament to Abraham at this point, could have simply said to Abraham, because you have done this, in blessing I'll bless you and in your seed, etc., etc. But he didn't, brethren. He made a most important statement, verse 16, five simple words in English, yet they represent the greatest gamble of all eternity. The greatest gamble in all eternity, of all eternity. By myself, I have sworn. Those five simple words teach us something more outstanding yet than Abraham's great example of faith. What does it mean to swear by yourself? In the New Testament, Jesus Christ said that we were not to swear. In fact, he said, don't swear by your head, for instance, because you cannot make one hair white or black. He said not to swear by your head, brethren, but why? Well, there is more to it than just the fact that we can make one hair white or black. In Middle Eastern law, if I made a bet with someone or if you made a promise and you said, for example, I swear by my best milking goat, if you lost the bet, you lost the goat. Whatever one swore by became the possession of the other person if one lost, if one didn't fulfill his promise or lost the bet. If you swore by yourself, brethren, you were laying your life on the line. But when Jesus Christ swore this to Abraham, he was not physical. Yes, he would have to die for us physically, but it is more than laying his physical life on the line. By myself, I have sworn. By my own life, my own eternal existence, I'll bring this to pass. Because if I don't bring this to pass, I will lose out forever. We see, brethren, Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament and wasn't swearing just to lose his physical existence for us. That had to happen. There was more here to this than we see on the surface. He was God. And he was willing to risk his Godhead to bring this all to pass. If he failed, Abraham's promises would not occur. Abraham would lie dead in his grave and remain in the dust forever. But God also would be dead forever. What we have in this chapter is the greatest gamble of all times, brethren. And we are called today to do God's work. But brethren... We have to realize something else about our present calling and our present spiritual struggles against Satan the devil. With these struggles become, it seems, more intense in this pre-Passover period. We have not been called primarily for personal salvation, brethren. And this is very important to understand because there are people who are among us, who have come among us only, in order to gain their personal salvation. They were not really concerned about the work of God. That's why when the apostasy came in 1995, many fell away. So we are not, again, we are not called, we have not been called primarily for personal salvation. Because if we have been called for that purpose, brethren, if that is what God wanted primarily, He would have waited until the world to come, when it will be easier to make it into God's kingdom. So God is putting us to risk. Are we aware of that, brethren? Do we understand that? He is putting us to risk by calling us now. Because it is easier to pull away in Satan's world. People in the world to come will not have Satan tempting them the way that we are being tempted today. Yes, there will be free moral agency. Some of them will still make the mistake and will lose 
their salvation, but a far greater percentage will make it into the kingdom of God in the world to come than the percentage of those that will have made it in the church of God over the last 2,000 years and those who were called before that time. There is a greater rate of attrition now simply by the logistics of the time in which we live because we live in Satan's time on this earth. Now, God has put us to a certain risk, brethren, and God has taken a gamble on us in calling us now because he has to do a work and he has to have a people prepared to serve humanity with Jesus Christ in the world to come. But this gamble here is far, far greater and its consequences would have been forever if Jesus Christ had failed. God was actually saying to Abraham, I'm going to do this for you, Abraham, and for you personally. And if I cannot accomplish it, I will die trying. Not just die physically, but I will give up what I have now. By myself have I sworn, while he was still a God being. I am willing to forfeit my own existence as God. Now what does that gamble that God took long ago mean to us today, brethren? Without a consideration of this, we fail to discern the Lord's body as we take a Passover unworldly in consequence. We know that it says in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 29, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we must discern Christ's body and all that that sacrifice entails on our behalf. For he sacrificed his body for us, because it wasn't just what he went through physically for us. It is what he could have lost out on forever for all eternity. When we talk in terms of true repentance, we find in the Bible that the book of the books teaches us three basic stages. The first stage of true repentance is seeing what we have done. The second stage is seeing what we are. Now, people usually succeed well in the first stage. Without too much difficulty, they see certain things that they have done wrong. But it takes some greater depth of perception through God's Spirit working with us to begin to see what we actually are. And the third stage in, is when we see what we have really done. So stage one you see what you have done. Stage two, you see what you are. Stage three, you see what you have really done. Now, there is a fourth stage in a sense, and it runs through all three of them. And that, of course, involves physical action. It involves change as well as mental change. Let us examine, first of all, stage one of true repentance when, you, when we see, when we come to see actually what we have done. As God begins to work with us with his Holy Spirit, as he begins to call us out of this world, we come to see that we have been keeping pagan holidays, we have been eating unclean stuff, and we have been attending a false church. Before, we have no concept of clean and unclean foods. And was Christian Christmas pagan? In no way. That is celebration, celebration that's celebrating surely the birth of Jesus Christ. Surely that is a Christian. And of course, attending a false Christian church with all churches going in the same direction. We were headed to heaven. But brethren, we came to see that we were keeping pagan holidays and that we had been attending false Christian churches. We came to see that something we took so for granted as taking God's name in vain, for example, was a sin. We don't worry about it being a sin before God calls us. Everybody's doing that, brethren. Everybody uses the name of God and Jesus Christ in vain. It is part of our culture. It is so deeply ingrained in us. The people use God's name in vain, not even realizing they have used it for the most time. So, we came to see that. We came to see sexual sin and many other things. We came to find out that smoking is a sin. Oh, you've got to be kidding. Smoking is a sin. Look at all these people that are doing it. It can't be a sin. Wearing of makeup is a sin. Brethren, things that we took for granted before God called us, 
we began to see that these things were wrong, that we had done wrong things. And generally, we came to see that we had been bra breaking God's laws in many areas. Romans chapter 3 and beginning in verse 9. Romans 3 verse 9, Paul says then regarding people in this world, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. We thought we were righteous in this world, brethren, didn't we? Some may have thought that they were born again Christians. Others believed they were true Orthodox or Catholic believers, members of the only true Christian church. Then we came to the Church of God and found out that far from being a good person, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. None who seeks after God, brethren. God found us. The Church came to us. We didn't find the Church. We couldn't find it without God opening our minds to the truth. Verse 12. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Dropping to verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Well, how many times did people take God's name in vain, brethren? There is no fear of God before their eyes. There is no lightning that suddenly strikes out of heaven. Everyone does his own thing and no one fears God because to their minds God keeps hands off and you can do whatever you want. But we began in the first stage to see sin in our lives. We examined our actions and we realized that we had been living contrary to God. And we began to make certain changes. That is the fourth stage, as I said, that runs through all the three. We began keeping the Sabbath instead of Sunday. We began keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread instead of Easter that Constantine imposed on Europe and on the Christian world in the 4th century. We repented of these things that we had done wrong and we began to change. But that wasn't sufficient for baptism. We had to come to stage 2. Stage 2 is when you come to see what you are. Our person can say that we have done certain things wrong. Oh, we can say, but I meant well. I was well-intentioned, I was well-intended for the most part, brethren. Even the world has a proverb that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But though I have done certain things wrong, well, you know, had I known the Sabbath was the true day of rest, I would have kept it. It's just that I didn't know. I knew it was wrong to lie, but human mind being what it is, we tend to reason and think, well, I did certain things wrong. But basically, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an okay person. I'm fine. Romans 8 verse 7, brethren. We were not lovers of God in the churches that we attended. And certainly we thought we were doing God a favor by attending a church on Sunday on his behalf. But in reality, we were the enemies of God. We hated God. We are no longer talking about actions and doing that which is wrong, brethren. We are talking about the frame of mind. Because it says in this verse, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So we were enemies of God. In spite of the fact that we might have thought, before being called, that we were such great and Christians in a good standing. God says that in spite of all the good things we thought we were doing, all the good intentions we had in our mind, because human mind is self-righteous, nevertheless, we were the enemies of God, and that carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So we pursued a God made in our own image when we went to churches of this world, brethren. God made man in his image, and man has returned the compliment. He has made God in his image. He has brought God down to his level, and he worships God his way. That is why people attend the church of their choice every Sunday morning. They're doing their own thing, not God's. That's how we all used to be, brethren. And so we see here the downpool of human nature. And we are not just talking about what we do, but we are 
but what we are and the way we think, the carnal mind. That is the word there in verse 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. And that carnal mind, of course, Jeremiah 17 9, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We didn't think of ourselves that way in this world, brethren, did we? It took God's Spirit to begin to open up to us to see what we are, what we are really like inside. Not just that we did wrong, but that we are wrong. The carnal mind is against God. Our way of living, our way of thinking before we were called was anti-God. But it is also hard for us to sometimes see that. As it says in Jeremiah 79, the reason it is hard for us to see it is that the carnal mind is deceitful above all things. We are deceived by our own mentality. And of all the creation that God has made on this earth, the most staggering is the human mind. And the reason that it is because the human mind is so evil, it thinks it is good. To this day, brethren, the demons and Satan believe that they are right and God is wrong. Lucifer is self-righteous. Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Well, you see, brethren, we know how to do good, but it says you are evil. Now, how does that add up? How does that match? If you're being evil, know, know how to give good gifts to your children, how does that match? You know, those works are good, of course. We are to be, we're not to be mean to our children. We are to be kind and good to them. We are to show them love. So how can Jesus Christ say, when you're doing that, you are evil? Well, and as we read in Romans 3, there is no one that does good, not even one. Now, Jesus Christ mentions doing something good, brethren, giving good gifts to your children. And Romans 3 says that no one does good. But the answer is, when we do good, we do it out of an evil motive which makes it evil in one sense. Because the motive behind the motive is that of self-exaltation. To do good of this world want to be recognized for their, under quote, righteousness. It is not to the glory of God. It is to the glory of self. The highest form of physical love in this world is considered to be mother's love for her child. But does she love a neighbor's children as much as she loves her own? Those mean little brats next door that throw stones at her kids? Does she love them as much as she loves her own child? No. Why not? Because that child is an extension of herself. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we start now hating our children and do wrong to them, brethren. On the contrary, we still do good to them, but we change the motive. The motive is, now, my child belongs to God, and I love my child to glorify God and turn my child toward God because, initially and firstly, God is their parent. Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23. Jesus says about the source of the problem. It is not just what we do, brethren. It is what we are. It is the way we think. Verse 20. And he said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within our mind. Out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. It is all on the inside, brethren. We know how to smile and appear nice on the outside, but inwardly, as it says in one scripture, are dead man's bones. Now true, he was talking about the Pharisees, but it applies to us as well because we have the same human nature. We have got it within us just as much as they had it. All these evil things come from within. It is not just what we do on the outside. It is what we are like on the inside. And of course, before baptism, we see more than just what we have done. We must see what we are 
and hate it. Job chapter 40 and verse 4, there are two steps in Job's repentance. And it is important that we see them because he was able to make an admission that he was wrong, in one sense wrong, but it wasn't sufficient for repentance because still God had to work with him. Job chapter 40, verse 4. Because, behold, Job says, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. So God had to work with him and then Job realized, because, behold, I am vile. That says in Hebrew, behold, I am nothing. What Job was saying was, okay, God, I understand. You told me about all the great things that you are able to do and accomplish. I thought I was something, but in comparison to you, I am nothing. But he should have known that from the beginning. That is a part of repentance, but he wasn't getting there yet, brethren. It is not sufficient. It is not a true repentance. And God still had to work with him until finally chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I abhor myself. The word myself is in the italics in uh, your English translations. It is not there in the original. But in this case the translators did a good and right thing. They added it. So I abhor myself. Not just what I have done. But what I am on the inside. Because of all the righteous people that lived, Brethren Job was among the top ones. If anyone did it right on human strength, Job was the man who did more good than any other. But he finally came to see the way he was on the inside and that his motivation was all wrong. It was all self-exaltation which ended up being a self-righteousness. Satan's problem. Therefore I abhor myself, and this time I see what I am. I repent in dust and ashes. So Job illustrates to us stage two, when we come to see what we are. And we will use now David to illustrate stage three, when we come to see what we have really done, what we really did. Second Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Now this story here is just as famous as the story of Abraham and Isaac. However, this one we could say is more notorious as opposed to famous. It relates, of course, to David's sin with Bathsheba. God waited nearly a year, brethren, for David to repent. God is very patient. But when David didn't repent, God sent to him a prophet. God sent Nathan or Nathan to David. Verse 1, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man, of course, represents David, king of the nation. He was the richest man in the Middle East, brethren, perhaps throughout the Mediterranean basin at that time. He was the most famous of all kings. The poor man was Uriah the, the Hittite, and the little lamb was representing Bathsheba. Verse 2, the rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe ew, ew lamb, female lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with, his, with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to, to him. Well, this was a parable. It was given to David as a true story in type. Now David believed it and didn't realize it was for him. Verse 5. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. In one breath, David pronounced the death penalty upon himself because he was the man 
as Nathan immediately pointed out in verse 7. Now, brethren, Nathan had a message for God, from God for David. And certainly Nathan might have, done, might have come to David with a certain amount of trepidation because he didn't know what David's reaction would be. Well, David, like some king, kings, could have just said, off with his head. But fortunately, David had been troubled to a certain extent by his own sin and by all those sins that he had not repented to God of those sins. Now, that it, that it was exposed, it came to time that it would be exposed. So now David was brought to repentance. But in stages, as we are going to see, verse 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Immediately he recognized and understood that sin is not primarily against people. In the truest sense of sin, we sin only against God because we break God's laws. People didn't write God's laws. We harm people with sin against God, but in the truest sense, we sin against God. I have sinned against the Lord. And we are going to see that this was only the initial understanding with David. But he had sinned against God's laws. There was far more to his sin against God than he fully realized at this point. When he came to the depth of understanding of what sin against God meant, then he wrote famous Psalm 51. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. You pronounce the death penalty on yourself. God is taking it away from you. However, there will have to be a substitute. Someone is going to have to die. Verse 14, However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Shall die in your stead, because if David was taken care of and killed, then the problem is resolved and the child could have lived, brethren. But keep in mind that the child did not have the Holy Spirit. The child's salvation was not at stake, brethren. David had his salvation at stake. The child didn't. Do we now understand a bit more and a bit deeper about the mercy of God? Because that child is going to come, brethren, in the second resurrection and will have opportunity to grow up and also will, have, will be given opportunity to inherit eternal life. But at this very time, the child didn't have the Holy Spirit. It was David. He is one of those few Old Testament individuals who had the Holy Spirit. His salvation was at stake. And therefore the child died in David's stead because David pronounced the death penalty. And not just this child. A thousand years from now, another child would be born to David of the lineage of David who would also have to die. This child was only a type. Now David fasted for seven days and besought God to spare life of the child. And it could not be, brethren. No one could stop what was absolutely necessary, the death of Jesus Christ. No man beseeching and pleading to God in that time to prevent the crucifixion of Jesus Christ could have stopped it from happening. His death had to happen. Even Jesus denied his death, pleaded that he would not have to die this way, brethren. And no amount of pleading, even on the part of Jesus Christ, could stop what had to happen. This child had to die, and a future child of David would have to die to make David's salvation possible. Now let's see verse 10. There was another part of trouble and curse that would come upon David for what had happened. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Look, David, God is saying, I could have given you peace. I could have given you rest from all your enemies. But because of what you have done, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me. But brethren, David never thought in terms of despising God when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband. But God said, this is what it demands. That is another reason why sin is against God. 
we are despising God and despising his laws. So now David saw that for the rest of his reign he will be troubled by warfare on his borders. Not only that, verse 11. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'll raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. So he'll suffer foreign war, but also from his own house would come a war, a civil war, domestic strife. And as we know, his own son Absalom would rebel against him and 23,000 people in Israel would die who would not have died otherwise. When David heard these two verses, he was left with one very obvious thought, brethren, that as the result of his sin, a lot of people were going to get hurt. 23,000 are just those that died in the civil war. We have no record of how many had died unnecessarily in foreign wars defending the borders of Israel. Now, when David heard these two verses, he was left with that obvious thought. And when he came to the point that he understood the full measure of what he had done, or was beginning to understand the full measure of what he had done, he made a public proclamation as a result of his sin with Bathsheba. Now you'll probably remember that another king, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, made the public proclamation too after his experience of punishment from God. You certainly remember the story that Nebuchadnezzar was mad for seven years and then his sanity was restored to him again by God. And he made a proclamation to the known world at the time. And that letter was dispatched to all the territories that he ruled in the Babylonian Empire. He gave his message to all peoples of the known world at that time. It is recorded for us in Daniel chapter 4, where he spoke of how God dealt with him. Now David also made a public proclamation to the world, brethren. Let us turn to Psalm 49. And before we read these three Psalms, 49, 50 and 51, I want to bring to your attention this. Psalm 51. Even though it is recognized as being written by David at the time of Bathsheba and what happened, Psalm 49 and 50 are not recognized that way. In fact, the commentaries give other interpretations of these two Psalms, none of them relating to David and the time of Bathsheba. So it has been speculated, though, that these two Psalms nevertheless could fit into that time. And they preface Psalm 51 and also indicate the three stages of repentance that we have been talking about today, brethren. Seeing what we have done, seeing what we are, and finally seeing what we have really done. So here is one possible interpretation. Again, I'm not saying as a doctrine, I'm saying this is one possible interpretation of Psalm 49 and 50. Some of the verses may not seem to fit, but we'll go through them nevertheless. Again, I'm not saying that this is definitely something that was put together by David at the time of Bathsheba, because other commentaries would not take it in that line. But, brethren, there is a distinct possibility, as you will see as we go through those Psalms, that these two preface Psalms, preface Psalm 51, a public proclamation for Psalm 49, verse 1. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world. So this wasn't just for Israel. This was for all nations. Both low and high, rich and poor together. Remember the parable of Nathan about the rich man and the poor man? My mouth shall speak wisdom and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. Brethren, David meditated long and hard on what had happened. I'll incline my ear to a proverb, the proverb of Nathan. I'll disclose my dark saying on the harp. I'm going to expose to you what is deep inside me, what I really feel I have done. Here is my dark saying, verse 5. Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? After all, I'm a king. I'm untouchable. So what if people begin to find out that I committed adultery with Bathsheba 
and that I killed her husband. I am untouchable because I am king. Why should I fear in the days of my evil, when the iniquity at my heel would surround me, when people begin to find out what happened? In other countries, kings do what they want. They get away with it. Why shouldn't I? This was my dark saying. My inward thought before God took me in, before God took me in hand. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches. Brethren, who had more riches than David at that time? A multitude of them, the rich man of the parable, but cannot give a ransom for himself. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a rans ransom for him. In other words, I cannot bring Uriah back to life. If I could give up all my wealth to make it possible, I would do so. But my brother is dead and he is going to stay dead. For the redemption of their souls is costly and it shall cease forever that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. For he sees wise men die. Likewise the fool and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. David says, I thought I was wise, but I found out that I am a fool and that I am a senseless person. And they leave their wealth to others, as I will. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Well, brethren, for God said you know, to me before Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 7, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I'll set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 16 of 2 Samuel 7. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. That's a special Davidic covenant we have recently been analyzing. Well, this was my inward thought then, says David, that my house will continue forever, my dwelling place to all generations. And they call their lands after their names. Even in 2 Samuel 12, which we were just reading, at the end of that same chapter we find that Joab was fighting against Rabbah of the people of Ammon. And 27, verse 27, And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah and I have taken the city's water supply. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. In other words, I want to call it after your name, David. It was to be named after David. So you see different groups in different lands, you know, took David's name to themselves at that time because he was so famous. The psalm continues. Nevertheless, Men, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. So David is saying, look, I have come to realize that I am no better than an animal. This is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their saying, Selah. Stop for a moment and think what you have read and then connect it with what is what, what follows. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning or in the resurrection. And their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. Now the next verse, verse 15, brethren, may seem to not fit. We need, however, to remember that David was in a state of repentance and therefore the sin would be covered. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. He shall receive me because of my repentance, because of what I expressed in Psalm 51. Now this Psalm 49 was David's proclamation, brethren. He was in covered language speaking of what he had done as the rich man. But it was what he had done. He wished he could undo it. He would have given all his wealth to pay the price for Uriah to bring him back to life. But he could not redeem the soul of his brother. So David repented of what he had done. But David also had to repent of what he was. So God made the proclamation to the world. The next psalm, Psalm 50, I am aware it says a psalm of Asaph. Now brethren, it can be also translated a psalm for Asaph. If it was 
for Asaph, then most likely, once again, it was written by David. And this time, it is God's proclamation. Psalm 49, David's proclamation to the world. Now God's proclamation because God had a lesson yet to get across to David. And of course, to get across to us. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. In other words, every corner of the globe. Now God goes on and speaks to the kingdom of people of Israel before he narrows it down to the individual. Verse 7. Hear, O my people, and I'll speak. O Israel, and I'll testify against you. I'm God your God. I'll not rebuke you for your sacrifices or for your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. And certainly, brethren, in David's reign, those offerings and sacrifices were certainly before God all the time, because David restored, as you know, the true worship of God. And David made sure that the people would continually be offering the sacrifices. But God says, I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. I don't need these things, God says. Verse 13, will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Yes, I have commanded them, but none of the sacrifices can make up for the right spirit and the right attitude and the repentant, contrite heart. This is the real sacrifice I want. Offer to God thanksgiving. In particular, thanksgiving for the wonderful forgiveness he has given us for sin. And pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I'll deliver you and you shall glorify me. And David was going to be faced with many days of trouble for the rest of his reign. Brethren, he also did deliver David. And now it narrows it down to the individual. Verse 16. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to declare my statutes? Or take my covenant in your mouth brethren who most declares or declared the god of israel at that time well david of course for as the king went so went the nation and god says look david what what are you doing declaring my statutes although you should take my covenant in your mouth because god made a special covenant with david in second samuel chapter 7 Seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you. You preach one thing out of your mouth, David, but for a whole year you lived a totally different way of life from that which you preach. And you did not condemn yourself. Look at your self-righteous indignation when you heard the parable of Nathan. And you're going to put that man to death because of one little lamb. You killed a human being and you stole his wife. Verse 18. When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You see, brethren, David murdered a man. So God says, you see, David, you murdered a man so you can steal his wife. You are being a partaker with adulterers. David committed adultery, which was stealing another man's wife. Yes, but he went beyond that, brethren. He killed that man so that he can then make that woman his wife. Something that should have never happened. Uriah had, he should have lived. So David was a thief as well as an adulterer. Verse 19, you give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. For several months, David, you plotted out and connived and you planned how to work it out that Uriah would think that the child was his. And when you couldn't finally work that out, you finally conspired to kill him. You gave your mouth to evil and your tongue to deceit. Verse 20, you sit and speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son. Well, because Uriah was like a brother to David, brethren, a loyal, faithful servant. It is like a slandering your own mother's son because you thought evil of Uriah. You hated the fact that he wouldn't comply with what you wanted done, so he would think that the child was his. Finally, you went to the ultimate course of killing him. Verse 21. These things you have done. And I kept silent. 
For a whole year, David, I said nothing. And in course of what of that you thought that I was such as one of yourself, you wouldn't repent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I'll rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. I said, Nathan, to you. Verse, so 22, verse 22. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Brethren, David's salvation was on the line. Verse 23. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, he that changes his ways and repents, I'll show the salvation of God. Now David saw what he had done, wished he could undo it. Now God was telling him what he was, what was he like. Romans 2 say about judging others when we do the same things. Romans 1, brethren, talk, talks about the Gentiles and what they have done. Romans 2 condemns the Jews because they're condemning the Gentiles for what they have done, thinking, we don't do it. We don't do that. But Paul says, oh, yes, you do. You may have done, you may not have done the physical action of committing adultery, and therefore you think, well, I'm so righteous because I haven't done it. But you have done it. You have done it up here with the mind. You see, brethren, some people, when they want to be baptized, can say, well, I see certain things I have done, but they don't have the concept that every day they have lived on the face of the earth. They were sinning against God, not by living, but because of what their mind was thinking every day of their life. Sin is not just what we have done, brethren. It is what we are. Psalm 51. After God's proclamation, David began to see far more of what his sin entailed. Have mercy upon me, O God. Now, David could not have said, you know, that God was merciful to others. Oh, I've been so kind, I've let people off. Please be merciful to me. David was the man in the parable who reached out and took what wasn't his and had no pity. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions, brethren, transgressions in plural, stealing, adultery, lying, murder, the whole gamut. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Because there was no way David could wash off that blood from his hands. God had already told him in the preceding psalm that no animal sacrifice would take care of it. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me, a horror of what he had done. And then verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned. In 2 Samuel, he said, I have sinned against the Lord, but now there is a greater emphasis on it. Against you, you only have I sinned. David had murdered a man, used his wife, brought about the death of their child. Absalom ultimately died. 23,000 other people died, and how many other thousands suffered, we don't know. But David says here in verse 4, Compared with what I have done to you, God, all that begins to pale into insignificance. It wasn't that it didn't mean anything to him what other people would suffer. He wrote Psalm 49 in that context, if that speculation is correct. But he began to see what he had done to God. And it was more than just transgressing God's laws what he had done to God. Brethren, to whom was David praying here in this psalm? Oh, it is not the Father. It says in the New Testament that Jesus Christ came to reveal the Father. So he was praying to the God of the Old Testament. He was praying to Jesus Christ. The God that David was down on his knees in front of. The God whose mercy he was begging. The God he was crying out to was the God who was going to have to die and die horribly in order for David's sins to be blotted out. It may well have been that at this point David realized that he had condemned his God to death. The God to whom he prayed was the God who was going to have to suffer terribly. Verse 16, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The only way I can come through this is with a repentant heart. 
Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. No animal sacrifice could have atoned for the sin, brethren. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It would require the sacrifice of God himself, the God to whom he had prayed. And only true repentance over that sacrifice, discerning the Lord's body, can bring forgiveness, the forgiveness spoken of in verse 17. Now, what tore David apart at the end? What shattered him to the point that he got down on his knees and deeply and bitterly repented in a way that he had not done before? He repented before, but never to the same depth, brethren. What really got to him was when he realized what was going to happen to God. It was a thousand years distance for David, two thousand years behind us, but he began to understand the full gravity and magnitude of sin. That it is not just breaking of God's law. It is the breaking of God himself. The God must die and die a terrible death to get across to us how terrible sin is and its consequences. Now, do we think that David understood what that death was going to be like? Well, he was the principal prophet to whom God prophesied that death. Psalm 22. It's often called Messianic Psalm. This psalm was written earlier by David. It is clear from this psalm that he is not talking about himself. If it was written earlier... If God inspired it earlier, then David went back and read it now with a whole new understanding. It may, however, be that God, brethren, after Psalm 51, inspired Psalm 22. Well, we may say, but that doesn't follow the sequential order. Well, keep in mind, other Psalms are not written in sequential order, brethren, from the standpoint of being consecutive in time. Psalm 32, for example, is recognized by the commentaries as related to Psalm 51, that it was written at the same time. But we don't find the same topic in Psalm 52, but in Psalm 32, because there are books and divisions in the Bible and certain subjects. The Psalms were placed according to subjects, not according to the time in which they were written. So, if Psalm 32 was written at the time, at the same time as Psalm 51, and the commentaries generally agree on that, then Psalm 22, who have been written after Psalm 51, when David really began to understand what God was going to have to go through. Maybe it was at that point that the God to whom he was praying in Psalm 51 revealed to him what it would take to cover David's sins. But if it was written earlier, then he must have gone back and read it with a new understanding. We mentioned earlier that this was the greatest gamble in all of eternity. God risked his eternal Godhead. It says in Philippians, I'll remind you, brethren, chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men. He, brethren, gave up his Godhead. Were there a possibility that he could or that he would never get it back again? Yes, it is true, brethren, that Jesus Christ was born of the Spirit through Mary. He didn't have a human father. His father was God. Mary was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is true that he had the Holy Spirit given to him as a gift of God from birth. And it is also true, as the Bible says, that he had the Holy Spirit without measure. But despite all those three advantages, Jesus Christ still had human nature that was imparted to him from his mother. And Jesus Christ was a free moral age agent. To manage 33 and a half years without one single sin of the mind, let alone the action, is utterly incredible. And one single sin would have blown it all. When Satan put a tempting thought into his, head, his mind, into his head, 
If at any one time he had entertained that thought, his sacrifice would not have been perfect and you and I would not be in this service today, brethren. And Jesus Christ would not exist, period. We need to understand what would have happened if Jesus Christ had failed. We may think with all those three advantages begotten by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, with God's Spirit from birth and the Spirit without measure, that surely He had it made. Well, brethren, if Jesus Christ was so sure He could win out, why did He fast 40 days before He took on that great temptation with Satan in the wilderness? If Jesus Christ was so sure He could make it through the crucifixion without sin, why did He beg God to do it some other way and to spare Him crucifixion? Jesus could have failed. That is why he said, By myself have I sworn. He was willing to give up his eternity that we might share salvation with him. Now, if Jesus had failed, Satan would have had the last laugh of God and this earth would have been incinerated because God said he wouldn't destroy it by a flood, but the incineration of this earth would have come early. If, when Jesus Christ was being crucified, he had yielded to one thought of hate, that would have been it, brethren. Without that perfect sacrifice, there would be no salvation for us, and there would be no fulfillment of the prophecies to Abraham, because they were dependent on that perfect sacrifice. Abraham would have lived and then died, and Abraham would have lied dead forever. And Jesus Christ would have been dead forever too. And what would be the reason for carrying on? To let human beings live in Satan's world with no chance of redemption? Well, God would have had to destroy it to put everyone out of his misery. And probably would have destroyed it by fire, as he will do with the third resurrection. Jesus would have died for his own sins and stayed dead. God wouldn't resurrect him for two reasons, brethren. First of all, because of his vow. By myself I have sworn. I've laid my eternal existence on the line. And secondly, if Jesus had begun to go the way of sin earlier on. If when Satan said, for example, bow down and worship me and I'll give you all these things. If Jesus said, okay, I'll do it. God could have never resurrected him, brethren. Why? Well, because if Jesus had begun... If he had begun to entertain sin and go the way of sin, if God had made him God again, then the two gods would have waged war on each other with two foreign minds. As Lucifer, when he became perverted, began to wage war on God. God the Father would have been left to himself as God being forever, with no chance no possibility of any other God being ever existing. Because he himself couldn't have come down to this earth and do it after Jesus Christ was dead. There would be no one to rule the universe and to rule the angels. And who would have resurrected God the Father from the dead if he had died for us? So Satan would have had the last laugh of God, of course. Yes, good have, God could have committed him to the outskirts of the universe. But Satan would have always had the satisfaction of knowing, I killed God. Psalm 22. David read this with new and tremendously deep and profound understanding. He understood now what it is that God would have to go through to make his salvation possible. A child would have been born to him a thousand years later, who would also die in his stead. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words, we know them very well. The words we know were uttered by Jesus Christ from the stake. Verse 2. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season... And am not silent. Well, he says in the night season, brethren, because of the six hours that he was at stake, three of them were daylight 
and three of them were utter night because God covered the earth with darkness for three hours. Yet though even God wasn't answering him as it seemed, he justified God. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Verse 7, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Well, we can read, brethren, about that in Matthew 27, how people laughed at Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, verse 43, almost the exact same words that Pharisees said. He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Verse 9, but you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts because Jesus Christ was called from day one. I was cast upon you from birth, from my mother's womb. You have been my God. It was God by his spirit that begat Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary. Verse 12, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Well, he looked like being torn by bulls after being scourged by the Roman soldiers. And those uh, whips were specially made out of uh, animal skin with the particles of the animal bones. So just imagine what happened to his flesh when those particles came into contact with his body. How they ripped apart his flesh, brethren. He was, he felt like being torn by the bulls. Verse 14, I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me, brethren. Bones out of joint as they lifted the cross up and dropped it to the ground. All his bones were out of joint. Verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hand, hands and my feet. Dogs referring to Gentiles, the Romans. They pierced my hands and my feet. This is so clearly not David. Jesus Christ inspired this to be written through David. And if it wasn't at the time of Psalm 51, then certainly David read it with a new meaning. But then, the psalm that speaks of the horrible sufferings goes on to emphasize something positive and wonderful. Brethren, the thing that kept Jesus Christ going through all of that. Vision. Without vision, people perish. We as people of God must have vision, brethren, of things beyond this world and beyond this present suffering. Vision, the vision of what was beyond his sufferings. Just as we must maintain the vision, brethren, because as Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That was said in Romans 8, 18. So hanging there on the stake, Jesus was able to say, that the day will come. Verse 22, I'll declare, when I'll declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. In other words, I'm going to live again in a whole new life. Verse 23, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All your descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. God had to put me through it. Yet, nor has he hidden his face from me. But when he cried to him, he heard. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I'll pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. The poor, brethren, probably the best, better translation would be the meek rather than poor. But the poor of the spirit meaning the same. Take it one way or the other, brethren. The poor or the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall come to my Passover to partake through the bread and the wine of my body and my blood. And they shall be satisfied. They shall have salvation. Verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. Salvation will one day be open to all humankind. Verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. Verse 40, 
speaking, brethren, now, of all of us in this room, of all of us in your rooms, of all of us in this call. Verse 30. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generations, speaking of the eras of God's church from the time of Jesus Christ's death. A woe to those who abolish the understanding of the church eras. Verse now 31 and 31. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born. As we declare it today, brethren, to this end time generation, that he has done this. What is that he has done this? That he, that God, the God who made men, became man and died for men. When we partake of the Passover, we must discern the Lord's body. We must discern what Jesus Christ was willing to go through for us and what he put at stake, his own eternity. Because if we are to preach this coming salvation to all humankind, we, of all people, must know what makes that salvation possible in our own lives.